Look at it on camera. <laughs> hey guys, this is Una. And for some reason she's gotten camera shy over the past few few months, but she's still playful as ever and healthy. As far as I could tell, she got a little sick when she moved in here, right here, right. But I'll put her back down because she uh, almost attacked me on the nose there. Anyways, my name is Reagan. Welcome back to my channel. I want to do something a little different today and just read it, just straight up read to you. But before I do, I want to preface with a story in Fox News. New York Times Paul Krugman skewered for complaining Supreme Court is on the side of civilizational collapse. He tweeted. Recently, you may have seen this individual, just to preface, Paul Krugman is an American economist, public intellectual, distinguished professor at economics at the Graduate Center of City U U University of New York. Uh, he writes about macroeconomics, trade, health care, social politics. In 2008, I believe he received the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences and more. Yes, quite an avid, outspoken individual. And here he is tweeting, undoing Roe is awful. Kneecapping in environmental regulation is existential. The Supreme Court has just come down on the side of civilizational collapse. Pretty bold statement. No doubt he's true. He's correct. Knee deep in civilizational collapse. Which brings me to my next article out of the New York Times itself, a corporate paid media outlet. However, this piece is an opinion guest essay written by Tim Kreider. And he just submitted it in this pretty good writing. I'm going to do my best to read it. Might be a little, uh, I might screw up on some of the smarter words. I don't know what every single word means, but you get the gist. Okay, here we go. And before, and also before I begin, let me also say that, you know, I guess a lot of you would be asking, like, what are you suggesting? We live in like a hippie commune and like hold hands and sing Kumbaya to the end of the world? Maybe. I don't know what Dr. Timothy Leary had. He was onto something in the 60s and 70s. I think that's more useful now than ever. As if, you know, we're not completely turned into a propaganda society. My nose is actually bleeding now. That's unbelievable. One moment. My nose continues to bleed during this presentation. Just ignore it. It's forming a scab. Okay, let's get into it. Ten years ago, I wrote an essay called The Busy Trap about the curse of busyness that seemed endemic at the time. The treadmill had been imperceptibly increasing its speed for a while, and people were nervously starting to notice. As happens with a lot of unavoidable evils, they try to rebrand their frantic busyness as a virtue. Busy. So busy. Crazy busy. Yes, I recall this in the 2010s. I know you stopped serving breakfast, Rick. Sheila told me you stopped serving breakfast. Why am I calling you by your first names? I don't even know who you are. Have you ever heard the expression, the customer is always right? Yeah. Here I am, the customer. That's not our policy. You have to order something from the lunch menu. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm really sorry, too. Okay, good! Everyone was busy. It was cool to be busy was the answer you got whenever you asked how they were. I came out in my essay as anti-busy. I advocated idling, daydreaming, hanging out, goofing off. My conclusion, life is too short to be busy. I guess a lot of other people have been thinking the same thing. For a few days, the essay was the thing everyone linked to, reposted and emailed. Other writers got paid to write responses to it. Some even debunked as though it were a fake Bigfoot film. Entrepreneurial self-help gurus cited it, invited me to conferences, the Colbert Report even called. But I was unreachable in the Idaho panhandle at my friend Carolyn's anniversary party, for which my agent has never really forgive it, forgiven me. Continuing, a decade later, people are still trying to sell the busyness as a vert, not, or, I'm sorry, skipping ahead. A decade later, pe late people aren't trying to sell busyness as a virtue anymore, not even to themselves. A new generation has grown to adulthood that's never known capitalism as a functioning economic system. My generation, X, was the first post-war cohort to be downwardly mobile, but millennials were the first to know how it going to know it going in. Our country's oligarchs forgot to maintain the crucial Horatio Algier function that everyone can get ahead with hard work, or maybe they just dropped it, figuring we had no longer any choice. 
Through the internet, we can peer enviously at our neighbors in civilized countries who get month-long vacations, don't have to devote themselves to paying off decades to paying off their college degrees, and aren't terrified of just going broke if they get sick. To young people, America seems less like a country than an inescapable web of scams. And hard work less like a virtual virtue than a propaganda slogan inane as just say no. The pandemic was a bomb cyclone of our discontents. It only gave us non-essential workers an experience of mandatory sloth, which for many turned out to be not altogether unpleasant, but also dredged up a lake full of long-submerged truths. It turns out that millions of people never actually got needed to waste days of their lives sitting in traffic or pantomime work under managerial scrutiny for eight hours a day. We learned that nurses, cashiers, trucks, and delivery people, who've always been too busy to brag about, actually ran the world and the rest of us were mostly useless super numinaries. The brutal hierarchies of work shifted for the first time in recent memory in favor of labor and outrage Wines of social Darwinists were a pleasure to savor. Of course, everyone is still busy, worse than busy, exhausted, too wiped at the end of the day to do more than stress, eat, binge, watch, and doom scroll. No one's calling it anything other than what it is anymore, an endless, frantic hamster wheel for survival. You've seen all the headlines about the great resignation. Gen Z millennials would rather be unemployed than unhappy in a job. Business Insider reported nervously, even though the youth of China are embracing the virtues of sloth with the lying flat and saying movements on YouTube, the faux guru self-help sing exhorts do nothing. Millions are now pursuing what a punk guitarist I know called the C- lifestyle. It's no longer just a subcultural ramble. Companies in Britain are now experimenting with a four-day work week. I think people are innervated not just by the Sisyphean pointlessness of their individual labors, but also the fact that they are working in and for a society in which increasingly they have zero faith or investment. The future their elders are preparing to bequeath them is one that reflects the fondest hopes of the same ignorant bigots a lot of them fled their hometowns to escape. American conservatism, which is demographically terminal, knows it, and is acting like a morbid Billionaire adi adding sadistic codicils to his will. More young people are opting. <coughs> More young people are opting not to have kids, not only because they can't afford them, but also because they assume they'll have only a scorched or sodden waste land to grow up in. An increasingly popular retirement is figuring civilization will collapse before you have to worry about it. I'm not sure anyone has composed a more eloquent epitaph for the planet than a stand-up comedian, Kath Barbado, who tweeted, It's pretty funny that the world is ending and we just have to keep going to our little jobs. Mid-century science fiction writers assumed that the increased productivity brought on by mechanization would bring workers an oppressive amount of leisure time, that our greatest threats would be boredom and ennui. But these authors' prodigious imaginations were hobbled by their humanity and rationality. They'd forgotten that the world is ordered not by reason or decency, but by rapacious avarice. In an actual dystopian future we now inhabit, the oligarchs have realized they can make we can work everyone harder, pay them less, eliminate benefits, turn every human institution from medicine to corrections into a racket, charge far more for basic rights and services than any people in any other nation would stand without revolting and get rich beyond the penny aunt dreams of a Carnegie or Astor. In the past few decades, capitalism has exponentially increased the creation of wealth for the incredibly wealthy at the negligible expense of the well-being, dignity, and happiness of most of humanity, plus the nominal cost of a mass extinction and the destruction of the biosphere, like cutting out the in inefficient business of digestion and metabolism by pouring a fine bottle of wine directly into the toilet, thereby eliminating the middleman of you. Everyone knows how productive you can be when you're avoiding something. We're currently experiencing the civilizational equivalent of that anxiety you feel when you have something due the next day that you haven't even started thinking about yet and you sit there helplessly watching whole seasons of mediocre TV or compulsively clicking through quintillions of memes as even as your brain screams at you the same way we scream at our politicians about guns and abortions and climate change to 
do something. I once watched in awe as my girlfriend, who had been lying inert on the couch, hypnotized with dread of whatever she had to do next, roused herself by annotating one, two, three, and on three immediately got up and swung into action. I have a shameful confession to make. Secretly, I'm not lazy. I've learned to do that I do literally nothing for more than a year or two at most, I start to get depressed. I'm not recanting my old manifesto. I still hope to get it to my grave without have, ever having to get a job job, showing up for eight or more hours a day to a place with fluorescent lighting where I'm expected to feign Bushido devotion to a company that could fire me tomorrow and someone's allowed to yell at you, but you're not allowed to yell back. But once I become genuinely engaged in a project, I can become frantically absorbed, spending hundreds of hours on it, no matter how useless and unremunerative. As a teacher, I edit my students' writing with a nitpicking precision and a big-picture ambition they may likely never experience again, and I don't believe most people are lazy. They would love to be fully deeply engaged in something worthwhile, something that actually mattered instead of forfeiting their limited hours on earth to make a little more money for men, they'd rather throw fruit as they pass by and trubles. Tumbrels. It's no coincidence that many social movements arose during the enforced idleness of quarantine. One important function of jobs is to keep you preoccupied and too tired to do anything else. Grade school teachers call it busy work, pointless time-wasting tasks to keep you from acting and bothering them. Even with the busy work already, we've been productive enough, produced way too much, in fact, and there's too much urgently that needs to be done, a republic to salvage, a civilizational to re reimagine infrastructure and reinvent, innumerable species to save, a world to restore, and millions who are impoverished, imprisoned, illiterate, sick, or starving, all while we waste our time at work. Okay? One, two, three. Hit like and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.